G'day everyone, here's my review of Femme Noir No. 1 by Atomic Pulp Comics. It's written and lettered by Christopher Mills, penciled by Joe Statton, inked by Horatio and Ottolini, with colours by Melissa Kircher. The Femme Fatale archetype is one of the most long-enduring, iconic, and in my opinion, underused of those that either emerged or was influenced by pulp and noir literature and cinema. It's different to the more culturally recent super-capable lady spy seen in Emma Peel, Charlie's Angels, Black Widow, Mila Jovovich's entire catalogue of work, Salt, Anna, and Lara Croft to name a few. The funny thing is that many Bond girls, from whose era the competent female super spy probably originated, themselves cross the line between lady spy and femme fatale. The femme fatale leans more into the sexuality of the character as opposed to her competence. This sexuality actually comes from a lack of physical competence. It comes from an inherent vulnerability. The femme fatale, short of hiding a gun or a blade, is usually physically outclassed in almost any situation versus a man. If she wasn't, she'd just be Black Widow all over again. If the man who is opposing her is an honourable sort, some sort of hero like the White Hats of the Westerns or, or men of action explorers and mystery men who follow rules and act in a noble way, her femininity is enough. By virtue of being female, they are automatically precluded from physically hurting her. If the man is not a noble one, or one who operates in shades of grey rather than black or white, she could be beaten, raped or killed. It's the acute awareness we have of her vulnerability that enhances the sexuality. We know she is largely powerless in her situation, so what weapons, what tools does she have to fall back on? Does she, like some female citizens during invasion in wartime, fall back on her femininity, her body to survive? How far would she go to survive? The femme fatale often has a very loose view of sex. She doesn't tend to value it beyond its use as a tool to control men and get her own way or ensure her own survival. Femme noir falls somewhere between the two. There is an undercurrent of sexuality in her idealised form, long blonde locks and an athletic frame clear even under her heavy coat. The domino mask, it could be argued, accentuates the dark eye makeup of the femme fatale, reducing femme noir's face to a hypersexualized female visage. Red lips, dark eyes, a cascade of blonde hair. At the same time, even though this idealised female is in dangerous situations where she should be outclassed, she's eminently competent and always comes out on top. The cover of the first issue is cool to look at and conveys the point of the character. She's beautiful and deadly, but it also falls very close to the pin-up art category. Yes, Femme Noir does shoot bad guys in the comic, which is what she's doing on the cover, but that's pretty vague. I suppose the first issue of a book has more license to get away with a pin-up than subsequent issues as it showcases the character and many first issues are origin issues where the hero doesn't become realised as a hero until the very end of the story. Femme Noir starts with a very era-appropriate credits page, almost looking like a Vanitas painting for the Noir era itself. I wonder if Femme Noir and Port Nocturne are existing simultaneously to Black Owl, or if the events of Femme Noir occurred decades beforehand. The technology shown in the comic doesn't indicate that it's a modern tale by the standards of something like Black Owl, but we've also seen places like Gotham City which is a fictional location represented as adhering to the aesthetics and sensibility of bygone eras, while at the same time Batman has wrist-top computers beyond anything that we had a few years ago. Then in the next scene, you'll see somebody driving around in an old Chrysler. It's possible this is a modern tale set in a city that for cultural reasons adheres to an old-fashioned aesthetic, but I never saw anybody flying a drone using the internet or playing their Spotify list on their iPhone. The opening page is a great bit of storytelling, and it makes me wonder about how people actually read their comics. It would be very easy to look at this page and think, dark and stormy night, guy goes into his office, classic PI, or maybe a reporter's office. It would be easy to look this page over, think that in a second or two, and move on. Sometimes my brain wants to do that, and I have to slow it down. I have to remind my brain that the writer wrote each of these panels, even though there is no text or dialogue. The writer placed them there specifically for effect, and the artist drew them, each one separately to create the effect and pacing the writer wanted. When each panel is addressed individually, you can see the pacing of a classic noir movie unfolding before your eyes. Surely this was the desired effect of the writer executed by the artist. Then we get this splash page, which is everything right about noir. The only way it could be more noir is if it was in black and white. The reporter muses about the identity of femme noir and begins discussing his top three candidates with the reader through the conceit of writing an article. He identifies the daughter of a murdered mob boss, a nightclub singer whose roommate is framed for murder, and a disenfranchised lady reporter as possible candidates to be secretly moonlighting as femme noir. Each explanation as to why is followed by a related action scene. The daughter of the mob boss takes out a mafia crew, the nightclub singer investigates the murder, and the lady reporter chases a dangerous story, a mad scientist holding the city hostage, Lois Lane style. Any of these three could believably be femme noir, and the end of the issue leaves us and the reporter no clearer as to her true identity, Regardless of her identity, the reporter concedes that she is effective, dangerous, and an avatar of justice.
You want the good of this issue? How about this bad mother right here? Brother Grimm killed the mob boss and looks cool as hell while doing it. He's not seen again in the issue at all. But this is some nice foreshadowing for his inevitable return in a later issue. Once again, writer Christopher Mills is doing a great job planting seeds for future storylines. This title is a love letter to pulp and to noir. It's gritty without being Sin City. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And while the art style is dark, the content isn't. Yes, it's got lippy bartenders, alleyway fights, cynical dirty cops, seductive singers, stormy nights, and mad scientists with death rays. I feel like it straddles the line between pulp revenge and mystery man vigilante stories. The mad scientist is straight out of a Fleischer Superman cartoon. If Femme Noir had a domino mask on, she'd straight up be a golden age vigilante. In 10 years time, she could be on the Justice Society roster. The book is 30 pages, a fast step above modern comics and for a fraction of the price. I'm paying for an Atomic Pulp digital comic what I paid for a physical issue of Spider-Man here in Australia more than 20 years ago. The colouring is great, really consistent with a cool blue hue to the pages. It makes the whole book look cold, distant, hard, like a good noir story should. The art was solid with only a few wonky panels and a, a kind of gonzo edge, but I don't know if it's the best fit for this kind of story. The art has that kind of South American cartoony exaggeration. It's really solid, but is it the best pick for this kind of story? I think I'd be looking for something a little bit more realistic or high contrast for a story of this tone, but the artist does a very good job with the style he has. This issue packs in a lot. You read some old Claremont issues of X-Men and it's a word salad. Pages of text boxes that crowd the panels. That's not to say that the guy isn't a brilliant writer, just that he was really fond of really heavy narration. Femme Noir comes close to this a few times with text boxes crowding the visuals. Noir storytelling often relies on heavy-handed narration. It's one of the things I like about the genre. It works well in movies and novels, but it can be a bit much in a visual medium where the narration is visual as well. This is accentuated by the unusual font choice. Seeing as how the story is being told by a reporter on a typewriter, you would think they'd just go with a typed font. The one that's been chosen is very high, very thin, and it's hard to track on the page. You have a bunch of these narration books sitting on top of one another, and you get a very busy page. I'll be blunt, as much as I enjoy this comic, it should probably be a backup story or a one-shot or an annual, not the first issue. The first issue of a comic may very well be your only issue. It might be the only issue your readers bother to purchase, especially in an ongoing title. Many modern books see a huge drop-off in the number of issues sold from the first to the second. People dip their toes in the water for the first issue and sometimes just don't bother coming back. As a writer, you've got one job in issue one. You have to give your readers a reason to come back. Comics aren't cheap anymore. We live in a binge culture. Netflix gives you whole seasons at once. No waiting week to week or in the case of comics, month to month is required. With binge culture, you can afford to wait until the media you are engaging with gets good. People don't mind engaging with slow burn storytelling for a great payoff. But it's not reasonable that people treat comics the same way. Someone might watch six episodes of a 12 episode series in a single sitting with the unspoken promise that it's building to something worthwhile. Stream shows are very little investment. You've already paid your monthly subscription, so watching a half a dozen episode on a friend or the internet's recommendation, worst case, costs you an evening or an afternoon. Waiting five or six issues for a comic to get good costs you 30 plus dollars and maybe half a year of waiting. That's a bigger risk to ask of anyone. Perhaps no issue matters as much as your first issue, and in Femme Noir's first issue, we haven't seen the title character. Not really. She might not even be one of the three women in the story. Femme Noir we're seeing in the story is a recount of a memory the reporter's retelling of what was told to him. So you've paid for a story that might not even necessarily be a story about femme noir. It's like buying a Superman comic and the whole issue is spent retracing a life of Clint Kent, only to get to the end and discover he isn't Superman at all. Even though the scenes we see are pretty cool and show femme noir is competent, she resolves each scenario handily, they lack impact because they're disconnected. I think they hint, at least the first two, that femme noir is neither of the women mentioned. I have a few ideas about what Mills might be doing with the femme noir character. The secret identities mentioned in this issue might all be red herrings. They might all be femme noir, working together to pool their resources to bring down their individual enemies. Femme noir might be some kind of body hopping spirit of justice that did indeed inhabit these women briefly at some point, and we the readers are just following her adventures. She might be some kind of fusion character like Firestorm that requires all three of these women to merge together to become the title character. I think the worst outcome would be that Femme Noir is just one of these women, an ordinary woman who somehow knocks out 300 pound violent criminals in two blows. Ultimately, does this issue do its job? Does it make me want to return for the next instalment? Yes and no. Yes, because I have faith in Mill's storytelling. I've read enough of his other works to know he has the chops to turn this into something I'll be glad I invested in. Yes, because you can't beat the price. Yes, because I like the depiction of the roles females had in these genres and in this era. They are somehow empowering, realistic and yet problematic at the same time. 
They allow a female character to break out of a damsel in distress role, but still require them to be both damsels and in distress. There is an added element of danger for Femme Noire when she faces off against a gun-wielding thug in a dark alley, as opposed to when Batman, Daredevil, Sam Spade, or even Parker does it. The fact that she is a woman heightens the expectation of danger. Yes, because there was some really nice stuff happening in the art. Some panels were just magic, pages that flowed so well. In fact, the only thing about Femme Noire number 1 that didn't make me want to come back was Femme Noire herself. And the reasons why were the exact ones listed above. In her first issue, I learned almost nothing about her. Who is she? Why does she do what she does? What are her powers, if any? What are her faults and foibles? Why should I like her? Being strong isn't enough, or this guy would be the most popular character in fiction. Being female isn't enough, or these films wouldn't have lost money. In issues 2 and onwards, I'm going to need Mills to give me, the reader, the inside scoop on Femme Noir if he wants to convince me to stick around. Fortunately, with the way that he writes, I know he can do that.